Right, here we go. Hopefully this Wi-Fi connection will hold up. It's been offline most of the morning, so finally decided it's feeling better. Um, let's just take Half-Life and Carbon dating from the top, seeing as we got interrupted on Wednesday. I apologize about that. Let's see. So when isotopes that are radioactive decay, they actually decay at a very steady rate. It's almost like the individual atoms of the isotope are lining up, waiting for their turn to jump off the cliff and decompose into a different element. And so that sets up a very steady rate of decay, which we call the half-life. Quite literally, the time it takes for half of the sample to radioactively decay. A good example of that, as we were talking about on uh, Wednesday, was strontium-90. That's an unstable isotope that decays by emitting radiation from the nucleus. And it emits beta radiation, which we said on Monday, was a neutron breaking down to give a proton and an electron. And it's the electron which is ejected from the nucleus as a stream of radiation. So the half-life for strontium is just over 28 years. About 28 years and, what would that be, 0.1? I guess about 28 years and six weeks or so. So if you start off with 100 grams, after 28 years have elapsed, you'll be down to almost 50 grams. Those 50 grams by mass is now the yttrium that it's turned into because of that change in the atomic number. After another 28.1 years, that 50 grams has become just 25 grams of strontium because we now have 75 grams of yttrium in the sample. And then after another 28.1 years, we're down to just 12.5 grams of the original sample in that 100 grams of chemical. Not changing the mass, it's just changing the identity of the isotope in that mass steadily. And that's what we refer to as the half-life. That's a relatively long half-life, uh, 28 years, although it's certainly by no means the longest. There are isotopes which we count by tens of thousands of years. But in comparison, we have isotopes like indium-116, which have a half-life of just 14 seconds. So we take a 40 gram sample of indium, it starts to, it starts to radioactively decay by beta emission, like the strontium. And after just 14 seconds, we'd be down to 20 grams of indium. After 28 seconds, we'd be down to 10, then five after 42, and 2.5 after 56, because most of it is turned into 10. So after a, just over a minute, more than 90% of the sample is radioactively decayed. And so more than 90% of the sample has stopped emitting radiation. And so we had mentioned this on Monday morning when we we're talking about people who might maybe need to get a CAT scan and how important it could be to figure out which isotope is being used for your radiation therapy. You need to find the isotope being used, which has the shortest half-life. That means the smallest dose of radiation. You take a half um, an isotope like thallium, which has a half-life of, I think, a couple of minutes. That's, that's a, um, we're talking about hours and hours more radiation um, when the indium sample would already have completely finished. Remember, there's no safe amount of radiation to be exposed to, but it is sometimes the smaller of the two eels. But always check and try and be exposed to the absolute minimum amount of radiation. Check and see whether your therapy can be done using an MRI. MRIs do not expose you to radiation. Sometimes doctors forget about that. 
Okay, so there's decay going on all around us. A good example of that is with the atmosphere above us. I've got stable atoms of nitrogen in the atmosphere, because nitrogen makes up about 80% of the air around us. And cosmic rays from the sun bombard that nitrogen in the form of neutron bombardment, and it causes those nitrogen atoms to be converted into unstable carbon atoms. Oh dear, my internet connection is telling me that it's unstable again. Everybody still hear me? You still there? Can I just get messages flashing? Yeah. yeah. Okay, right. Yeah, so, we're here. Okay. So that carbon that's produced is an unstable form of carbon. And that carbon starts to radioactively decay, as carbon does, by beta emission. But because the half-life of carbon is pretty long, it almost 6,000 years, 5,730 years. So as it emits radiation, it sometimes combines with oxygen in the atmosphere to create carbon dioxide. And so that carbon dioxide is unstable because of the carbon in each molecule emitting radiation. And sometimes that carbon dioxide makes its way into trees and plants because of photosynthesis. They consume carbon dioxide and water to produce oxygen and energy. So that carbon being absorbed by plants enters the food chain. We eat the plants, or sometimes the animals eat the plants, and sometimes, unfortunately, we eat the animals that eat the plants. So over the course of our life, there's a pretty steady amount of carbon-14 in our body, which is emitting radiation. And that emission from our bodies continues long after our deaths, for tens of thousands of years. Remember that half-life is just for half of the sample to finish radioactively decaying. So we can use that um, decay of carbon to work out the age of a fossil or artifact based on how much carbon-14 still remains in the sample. And work that back through the half-lives until we get to the amount of carbon in a living tissue sample. So carbon dating based on the half-life of carbon has been used um, for many um, historical artifacts. We've got things like the Turin Shroud, which seems quite definitely fake now, um, only looks to be about 700 years old. Dead Sea Scrolls, on the other hand, look to be about 2,000 years old and are thought to be completely authentic. Some of the older Egyptian mummies you see in museums tend to be three to 4,000 years old. Uh, some of the earliest human remains found in Texas are dated back to about 10,000 years. Put that in perspective with the end of the dinosaurs, which was about 65 million years ago. And then put the dinosaurs in their place and realize that the oldest earth rocks that we found are around about 4 billion years old, aging the time and age of the entire planet itself. A friend of mine in college one time worked out that if the lifespan of the planet, that four uh, billion years, was just 24 hours, it would mean that the human race showed up three seconds before midnight. So I, I pointed out to him that probably explained doing things like that, probably explained why he didn't have a girlfriend, but he didn't like that suggestion. Okay. I'm just going to stop using that joke because nobody laughs. Nobody appreciates me, appreciates me anymore. Okay. What are you talking about? Yeah. So, we can't smell radiation. We can't see it. We can't touch it. We can't taste it. 
So this is a problem for something which is so bad for our health. But radiation is ionizing. When it passes through matter, it causes the loss of electrons. And that a loss of electrons can be tracked using a Geiger counter. We've probably seen them used on television in movies and things. It basically looks like a guy who's got a power pack with a, a microphone that kind of points around the room. And then is a is a inside that microphone is a sealed chamber of argon gas. Because argon, one of the noble gases, it's not normally chemically reactive. But if radiation comes in through that open window, then as the radiation strikes those argon atoms, it causes the argon atoms to lose electrons. So we get ionization of the argon. Let's find my tools here. There we go. Let's use blue today. So the a Geiger counter is connected up to the battery. Let me try and get that in the picture as well. There we go. So the battery is connected up to the Geiger counter. Now the rod that's in the middle is a positive electrode. And so these electrons are instinctively attracted and drawn towards the positive electrode. They pass down the electrode, down the circuit, where they are amplified and counted, and that's what gives the um, clicking sound you normally associate with a Giga counter. The faster the clicking, the greater the um, source of electrons, and the stronger the radiation source. Meanwhile, those argon ions plus, they're attracted to the walls of the detector, which is where we have lined the negative electrode. And at that negative electrode on the walls, they pick up electrons once more and turn back into argon atoms. So we replenish the supply of argon to detect more radiation. Really quite clever machine. And so the speed of the clicking tells us about the intensity of the radiation. That's part of the idea why um, radiation is so dangerous, because if that radiation comes into contact with you, it causes cells in your body to lose electrons, and that could create these small fragments that create uh, called radicals, which could be inhaled in the body, and could interact with the very DNA and change your genetic code. Not sure if you can hear my kids in the background, but I can hear them. They somehow, they just, I think it's just a really noisy class they go to at school, but they just, everything's shouting. Oh, oh you're all right. I'm all right. Inside voice, people. Anyway. So radiation is so dangerous, and we need to try and protect ourselves from radiation too. Now, not all radiation is equally as dangerous. It depends how penetrating that radiation is. For example, um, the level of penetration for radiation greatly reduces as it create uh, lose sorry as it gains mass and charge. So radiation is less penetrating as it has mass or charge. So, for example, alpha radiation which is a stream of protons and neutrons. Those subatomic particles have mass, which slows them down, and the protons have charge, which slows them down. So it doesn't take much effort to block an alpha emitter, usually only about two or three centimeters of paper will completely block off the source from you. Keep in mind, however, that some alpha emitters, like radon, they're airborne. And so you could inhale that unstable isotope 
and it could still cause damage. Beta emitters, which emit a stream of electrons, are more dangerous. They are more penetrating because although they have um, charge, which slows them down, they don't have mass associated with them. And so they're more penetrating than alpha emitters. But the biggest problem for us is always gamma radiation. That's a release of pure wave energy with a very short wavelength and therefore a very high intensity and frequency. And there's no mass associated with the radiation. There's no electrical charge associated with the radiation. And so it's the most penetrating. So while a beta emitter would only need 0.5 centimeters of lead to block it, gamma radiation needs at least 10 centimeters of lead to block it. Is that what most uh, hazmat suits contain? Um, that I'm not sure. I'm not sure what um, kind of radiation they're trying to uh, stop. Oh. I can't imagine they have much lead in them. I mean, 10 centimeters of lead around the suit would be an incredibly heavy suit. Oh. Well, I mean, like, I mean, like the ones at the power plants and nuclear reactors. Uh, huh? Like many of those, like, you know, like like the ones in Russia that had those that they are most known for those disasters. I mean the the suits they had didn't really do them much much good. It gave them just very little. It was more about just not inhaling particles that were airborne and could be inhaled into the body and cause um, radiation damage. It's more about just not inhaling things, and making sure you could zip that suit off, go through a shower and be completely clean and free of any matter that was radioactive. Mm. Uh, you look at the Chernobyl disaster, most of the people who were in the, um, by the core, I mean, they died in seconds. Oh. Suits or not, it really did not do them any trouble. There's actually, I've always been obsessed with that disaster. There's really, there's a really good uh, doc, well, it's not a documentary, it's kind of drama for pseudo documentary that I saw on HBO, but I don't think HBO was the original source that talks about Chernobyl. It's like a five episode miniseries last year. They are really good um, depiction of it and how things happened. And yeah. something like, I think it was six months because the, the core, the roof of the, the core just blew up. It absolutely blew up and things went uh, south. Was so it a meltdown? A big hole in the roof, uh, which was just gushing out radiation. And so they took volunteers of, I think mainly Russian soldiers, or they'd take anybody they could get, and they had to go out for 30 seconds at a time, just carrying wheelbarrows full of rubble and dirt, and they would just tip it over the edge of the, the roof into the core, and then scurry back, and they would only have 30 seconds at a time before they would become, um, well, probably very sick and probably die. Just mm. a whole team of people scurrying up, like, okay, you're next, out you go, come back, uh, next person, you know, just crazy. The lengths they went, they went to, and they were just told, you know, you're going to die, but we will look after your families if you take this hit for us. So, oh, I hear that in like many of those, like the towns are cut off for good. And even though we can't go there, some plants manage to survive and regrow. But um, it's kind of, you know, in some ways, I often think if it was going to happen, maybe it's maybe it's good that it happened in Russia. Because you can imagine, can you imagine, I'm not not just Americans, but people from the West, people from Britain, or people from America, volunteering for a job like that. I don't know if we get the volunteers, to be honest. You wouldn't catch me dead working at a nuclear reactor. Okay. Right. That, I think, yep, that is the end of the chapter. Woohoo, we have made it to the end. So let's use our time, our last 20 minutes or so, 